Our relationship with space is an increasingly complex one. Our panel of experts will dive into all things spatial as we explore home, work and play and city spaces in the next decade. Please welcome your host, Marita, the Industry X lead at Accenture. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you for having us uh, here. So today we will uh, explore this, uh, how we can work, uh, play, and, uh, and uh, live uh, in the next, in the next uh, space of the decades. With me, I have uh, a, quite a lot of uh, gentlemen. I will uh, start uh, from the start, from uh, Chintan Nonarup, that he can uh, introduce himself. Uh. Okay. Thanks, Maita. Hi, um, I'm Chintan Raveshia. So I lead the city's business for Arup, which is a multidisciplinary organization in the built environment. Um, and I, am, I look at the Southeast Asia context. So it's interesting because it's a variety of markets that I have to look from a very developed situation like Singapore uh, down to looking at uh, very, very special, specific challenges uh, around equity, et cetera, in other parts of Southeast Asia. And in the previous panel, we talked about around, um, uh, the, they were talking about around sustainability and around sea level rise, which is a very specific issue around climate change in Southeast Asia, because most of the cities are islands or close to water. And so this is where I basically come from, which is looking at what does that mean in terms of uh, cities, uh, in terms of what governments need for the future, in terms of how do we work in this climate emergency era developing uh, new cities or decarbonizing existing cities. So for example, I led the planning for the new capital city for Indonesia. So we did really think about how a new city in the world in the future has to look, breathe, behave, think differently than what our current cities are because they need to look and feel and behave very differently. And from that point, I mean, similarly going down to with something very specific like looking at what food in cities mean as well. So uh, what is that future of our CBDs? What is the future of our cities when we have the regenerative aspect of our cities become one where everything around us is looking towards carbon negativity or growing our food and all of that. So quite a lot of interesting parts that makes me think about what the future of our cities would be. Great. Uh, and I think that uh, from the architecture point of view, it would be good to, to pass to Kenneth to tell us a bit of uh, what is the technology needed empowered by Siemens that uh, can create these smart cities. Over to you. Thanks, Melita. Um, so uh, my name is Kenneth Chan and I'm the uh, regional uh, CFO for uh, Siemens, and uh, I'm also uh, also the CFO for the smart infrastructure business. And uh, as uh, what uh, the previous panel discussions that's taken place, and also uh, for now, what we are seeing also uh, the huge uh, technology innovation that's coming through uh, in um, the type of products that we have, the applications that we have in looking at sustainability. It's it's a it's this global trend that more and more people are also uh, continue to move into cities. At the end of the day, uh, we're seeing that uh, roughly about seven million uh, people uh, each year are moving within in ASEAN uh, into cities, and it's a it's incredible uh, amount of pace in which we have populations moving there, but obviously brings problems as well as what we talk about, sustainability, climate change, and it's, it's these topics that uh, Siemens is looking at uh, building up uh, technologies and innovation uh, to help solve some of these problems. Great. And uh, John, we Thank saw you. a bit of a glance of uh, uh, before with the, the, the extraordinary video. You can uh, just uh, tell us a bit about yourself and maybe you can give us a bit of a glance of the metaverse. 
Okay, my name is John. As I probably show you, we are in the business of digitizing cities. Uh, as much as metaverse is now the new shining uh, buzzword, uh, we don't necessarily believe the next internet revolution revolves around blockchain and, and stuff and AR and VR. What we believe, and I experience it myself, is, is the, I mean, the internet will grow from a 2D flat media to 3D interactive and immersive uh, models. I remember in the early days when I first got hold of the internet browser, it was a uh, Netscape browser. At that time, we were consuming images, text, video, and audio. Google has practically conquered the re you know, indexing all your 2D information. We believe the next internet revolution is going to happen in the, next, in the browser space. You will see more and more of interactive and immersive content out of the out of the browser and and we we think we are in the business of helping developers uh, content players and governments and 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 uh, e-commerce build the next generation internet by empowering you with a powerful tool to visualize and digitize your 3d content uh, creating a one-to-one -one exact replica of your real world great thank you and uh, based on what you said about the digitalization, I think uh, digital made it uh, for us possible to work uh, remotely the past uh, almost two years due to COVID. Uh, but it seems that uh, hybrid is a new thing uh, that is moving forward. Uh, and uh, all of the companies are trying to figure out uh, how the hybrid can work. I mean, there is not one fits uh, for all. So I would like to get uh, Kenneth's perspective, I mean, uh, on some main principles that uh, each uh, enterprise needs to consider when they go to the hybrid uh, workplace. Uh, Kenneth. Thank you. Thanks, Melita. And uh, I think one, one of the key topics, uh, and we've heard it throughout this whole session, is about digital, digital tools, uh, which is a fundable, fundamental element in terms of making uh, a building more resilient, um, more flexible. Um, buildings and workspaces are effectively in the future getting even more digital. Uh, if we talk, for example, like a, a facility manager these days, uh, uh, not only will he look at automation, uh, but uh, remotely also that he will be able to um, cover more functionalities. Uh, if we uh, look at a building, there is even more sensors that are being placed in the building. Uh, so you're getting a much richer integrated uh, visual visualizations that you see. Uh, we are talking about digital twins as, as what uh, has been played out. Uh, and ultimately, uh, with a lot of these uh, information that is being brought up, uh, it brings us to a new level uh, in which we are having even a more finer detail uh, of controls and having a more richer data set at the end of the day. So, so ultimately, all of this type of information will help in terms of a building being more resilient and flexible. Great. Uh, and uh, I mean, we heard about how the indoor and how you can drive much more engagement within the buildings. Uh, I would like to understand from Chinta and Abita on uh, how the pandemic can change the city spaces, the outdoor and the urban side of the things. Uh, especially, uh, we know uh, the CBDs of uh, all of uh, our cities are very much uh, driven from work uh, culture and just uh, bringing the financial uh, powerhouse. So I would like to understand uh, your view on how you think uh, that uh, the future city spaces will be transformed. Yeah, thanks. It's, it's, a, it's a very interesting challenge for us. And Kennedy spoke about the hybrid part of it. And that's exactly when I start looking at it from the city space of the next decade point of view. I was asked this question last week. Um, now the fact that we're all going back to work a little bit, a few days here and there, and they're like, oh, are we going to see you every day? I'm like, no way. You know, I'm going to come maximum two or three days a week, but I love that, that thing of working from home and working from office. I love that. I come to the office for banter. 
I come to the office because I want to have a good chat with colleagues and stuff like that and create the relationships so we can do stuff together. Um, Arab headquarters, just the new, the new office just opened and coincidentally it was supposed to open in 2019. We had to switch off all of that, replan the entire office in the last two years, thinking about what the post-pandemic worker wants. Um, and it's all about creating that experience. So that's the indoor part that we're trying to change. But it also made me start thinking when I started thinking about the city space and working with URA, et cetera, in Singapore, was if most people are like me, thinking that 20% of my time, I actually want to work from home, which means 20% of real estate in the city center is going to be empty because 20% of the people are not going to be at any given point in time in the office. What happens to that space? And what has happened even in terms of the spatial aspect around uh, on supporting users in the city centers is, I have seen every other week, sadly, some of the other cafe around my office shutting down in the last two years. But at the same time, I live near Juchiat, which I call the shortage of, uh, sorry, I used to live in the UK first, London. It, it's one of the cool areas of Singapore. And every other week, I see a bar or a cafe opening up in, 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 in Juchiat. And how is that changing? And that's because that allowance of mixity that exists in, in, in our residential areas now it allows for that to proliferate, being more resilient in terms of economics, but also culturally. How do we change that in our city centers? City centers, I mean, Singapore, we did a quick calculation that 20% um, of our GDP is connected to our work that happens in our city centers or CBDs. And that's bloody important. What happens to that? Are we just going to say it just goes away? Identity is super important for cities. If you take a, think about Singapore, Google Singapore, Google any of the Sydney or whatever, the photograph that you see is always of a city center that makes it an identity of the city. And if that collapses, what is the identity that it connects with internationally? Because cities work locally, but also internationally. Um, so it, these are quite interesting challenges we have to think about how CBDs will need to, need to, they don't have a choice, but need to become more mixed use. And by just by saying that, by saying, okay, we're going to add more residential, but the economics of adding residential is very, very difficult. Because one thing is that aspect of one plot turning into a residential building. The other thing is about, okay, if there is a residential building, I need to provide a school next to it. I need to provide a hawker center next to it. I need to provide all of those amenities for the cultural identity to exit in city centers. And that will truly, truly transform our futures of our city centers. And this we had to tackle when we were planning the Indonesia's new capital city. How do we define all of these centers and how do I, within 10 minutes in my neighborhood, we still have that identity aspect of being able to walk to my school, my physician, et cetera, but also to my workplace. And how is that little work play literally going to change for my child in the future, including, and I was speaking about, we are working with the government for the food aspect but food growing around us. What is that CBD going to be of the future where literally kids get out and see food growing around them and thinking, this is normal. I don't have to wait for food to come from somewhere else in the world. So yeah, this is all keeps me excited and keep me, keeps me going. True, and I think we are a bit lucky in Singapore because I believe that uh, we are very close to this 50 minutes uh, city concept <laughs> in general. But yeah, it's very interesting. And uh, John, you spoke about before about metaverse. Uh, and um, okay, maybe uh, I know from uh, some uh, from my stepson that uh, is mainly on the gaming at this uh, moment. But uh, Microsoft is training very hard to use metaverse uh, for the workplace. So how do you think uh, Metaverse can influence the whole workplace and the hybrid side of the things? Okay, long before the word Metaverse surfaced, I think we have been in the business of creating the 3D internet, meaning the browser will evolve from a 2D content into a 3D content. I don't necessarily believe in a gaming kind of world, like, you know, reliving our second life. You know, everybody go into a low polygon world, wear a VR goggles to do shopping and e-commerce. You know, uh, I think there's a lot of uh, hype and a lot of get-rich scheme around the metaverses and NFT. Most of these people, I would say they never play a game. Yeah. And, and I came from China. You know, China is a hotbed of gaming companies. A lot of these metaverses company now used to be gaming company. They can't make it in the gaming world. They can't make it in the Tencent and NetEase of the world. They have to evolve. They're using their 3D graphics uh, uh, you know, gaming experience to evolve and create virtual world. 
what we are creating is a digital one-to-one -one replica, exact replica of the real world. You saw our collaboration in SLA will empower SLA to create a new kind of one map 3D, which allows everybody to look at your photorealistic building from area view to city view. And the most important thing that we are solving is the recency. SLA has spent effort in the last four years to try to digitize Singapore using drones. That thing is human skill. It is not machine skill. How often can you give a map to Singapore, Singapore government and planners to do their work? And we provide that kind of scalability because we make use of AI, computer vision and satellite imagery and transform satellite imagery from 2D images to 3D models on scale. And that is why we are able to clone in countries like Indonesia and Malaysia and also countries that Google drones cannot fly to right? because of their being Muslim countries. So we are helping city governments, architects, security, defence to build living digital simulation model of the cities which has near real-time status update as the physical counterpart changes. So I guess uh, this is exciting times for us. For me, I see with the advent of 5G and with the proliferation of uh, internet, browser and stuff, the browser is going to get hotter. I, I don't necessarily believe in having AR and VR to go and browse an e-commerce store and stuff. But the best natural medium to share internet content or 3D content is your browser. You just need to copy and paste a URL and send it to someone. You can virtually visit Singapore, go to a museum, do shopping, everything, right? So the last internet revolution, which is about 2D, I think the next 15 years, whoever is going to you know, uh, get a piece of the pie, I think this is big enough for everybody. We are more interested in the post-Google world, indexing the world in 3D, creating the largest database of 3D cities. Okay. And since we are on uh, this side, uh, uh, tell me a bit about, because you said that you may not post uh, Google, tell me about your view from your company about the special computing. Uh, so I say Google's, Google Earth, you probably have used Google Earth for you know, checking out maps and 3D cities. They have only covered 50 cities. The last check from United Nations, there are 10,000 cities in, on planet Earth half of which surfaced during the last 40 years. So imagine if Google were to digitize all these cities, first of all, discounting the fact that geopolitical reason they can't visit some Muslim country, they naturally don't have China model or, or any of the sensitive countries out there. This is a humongous task. Nobody can clone and digitize a 3D models of the, sea, of the entire planet Earth. But using satellite, it gives us a chance. Because that I, no need to, I don't have to send a single drone. Recently, I can't name the names, we've been engaged by a news agency to give them a digital clone model of Ukraine. A news agency for their storytelling. And in, in coming, coming closer to our shore, we are just barely one and, one and a half year old, but we have signed up 25 customers, mostly governments and security. And our first defence customers is our local defence. So you can imagine having a 3D model of cities, of spaces, of street level, of indoors, of outdoor, creating exact replica can transform many businesses and, and vertical industry because we are, we are giving you new power, powerful ways to interact with content. No longer flat content, but 3D interactive immersive content inside your browser. Right? Very insightful. And uh, actually, when you hear all of these uh, technologies, which is uh, always a mind-blowing uh, uh, for me, I'm uh, also thinking uh, that at the same time, uh, we are really our uh, uh, fight for our net zero commitments for uh, the climate change. Uh, and uh, buildings at the end of the day, it's uh, the source of 40% of the total emissions. Uh, so I would like to understand from Kenneth uh, what uh, you think that uh, the owner uh, can do in order to drive uh, a much more green uh, agenda so we can use the technology in the right way? Yeah, um, I think when we talk about net zero energy, um, you can't do without 
digital tools or digitalization. Um, ultimately, uh, if you look at any new clean energy systems that are being produced, uh, the fundamental part or element is embedded with digitalization at the end of the day. Um, so if we talk about, let's say, uh, AI algorithms that are actually driving or optimizing uh, wind power, um, then you have, uh, we have smart grids, we have virtual power plants, uh, which kind of balance the uh, multi-directional flow of energy. Buildings in itself also will play a major part, as you said, 40% of carbon emissions. Uh, we'll be able to adapt and proactively save energy costs, save power at the end of the day. Um, so what we are seeing now is that um, the kind of information that are, that are coming out uh, from digitalization, it can be supported right throughout the whole value chain of generation to the transmission and distribution and in terms of uh, demand itself, uh, it's bringing us to a new level where we can develop uh, more intelligent systems at the end of the day, uh, which ulti ultimately lead to better clean energy systems uh, available in the market at the end of the day. Uh, but when we talk also about buildings at the end of the day, uh, and we talk about uh, power networks, uh, in this particular industry, I think digitalization has not been adopted as fast as other industries. Um, one of the reasons uh, is also that although we have a lot of building data, uh, we don't ultimately use that data so far uh, to make it more beneficial, more efficient for the buildings. Uh, and if we, if we even talk about um, a building or organization having maybe two similar type buildings, uh, the information in each of these two similar buildings are not really being used uh, in a comparable way to solve solutions, and it's not enough at the moment uh, uh, what we see. Uh, a lot of the, uh, uh, the topics about uh, the buildings itself uh, the owners of the building having this information, they rarely share that data. So, so what, what we do see is that uh, if we can open up the collaboration and being able to uh, extend that information uh, out into the overall community, uh, we'll be able to have even better benchmarks at the end of the day and ultimately leading into uh, a more sustainable, more more efficient type uh, systems, which will improve uh, the overall environment. Yeah. Very good. I think uh, how to create the grid is super important. And uh, I would like uh, to, to close with uh, Chintan, uh, to, for you to tell us a bit of, uh, I mean, we talk again all the time about the smart and sustainable, but what does it mean uh, in terms of, in the context of livability, how I can, uh, let me say, experience it uh, as a citizen? Over to you. Yeah, I think listening to both John and Ken, first of all, John, I think you're going to get me out of business. If everyone starts living in the virtual metaverse, no one's going to live in my city anymore because they're going to all have that. But probably good for the environment to less build. Um, but anyway, we need to talk after this because it's very interesting what you're doing. Um, I, I, what's, what's interesting and it's exact what Kenneth, what you're talking about as well is, uh, so I'll use an example again of Indonesia capital. Uh, the, we were thinking about what the catchphrase should be for the city, and we came up with something called as uh, World City for All. And for all, we meant not only human beings, but the flora and the fauna and the animals who live there currently, and the human beings who live there, every aspect had to, had to come together in terms of that sustainability point of it. So we had to go beyond people, place, we had to think about people, place, and planet. So everything that we do had to follow that logic. Um, and hence, the whole energy grid, the whole idea of conversation, even right now when we are talking to the Singapore government about 
energy and hydrogen and etc. It's exactly that point. How do we change the future of our cities whilst keeping the experience, and we call it lovability aspect of the city, still the way it is, it's not going to change that. We still want people to experience. I mean, the fact that we are happy today that we are talking face to face is so much better than being on Zoom or anything of that. And those spaces and those experiences still need to say because that identity is what's going to keep us together. So our idea is to literally look at, yes, digital tools are here to stay. A lot of experiences will change in the future. And how do we bring that experience and enhance the enduring aspect of the cities. Exactly what I talked about for our office space, which is changing in London, is the whole idea is endearing. Why do I want to go to the office? Because it's fun. I want to have the memories in place, and I want to live that nostalgia physically. Um, it's the challenge, whilst not increasing the carbon or decarbonization, which is the biggest word for me right now for this year, of how do we decarbonize every aspect of the system that we are doing. Um, in terms of pure experience to buildability aspect of it. And for that, it's zero time up, so I'm going to pass it back to you. <laughs> sure. I think that we can take, out, take uh, uh, away this, uh, how you can create this fun aspect uh, of uh, driving the right incentives. That's why sometimes I believe uh, maybe gamification, mm -hmm. we can just take out only this part <laughs> in order to have this sense of belonging, belonging and drive the right uh, incentives for uh, something uh, smart, green, and sustainable. Yep. I, that, thank you very much. Uh, we are up of time. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for joining us on stage.